about heavy metal, but you know what? They weren't swinging any metal yesterday at the ravine. Welcome to the Brew Dog Show, Rudy Reyes. Welcome to a Major League Baseball special. This is in addition you're not going to miss out on. This is a post game two between the Houston Astros Dodgers at the ravine. Games one and two are in the books. I'm right here on Facebook Live. Also, you can find me on Spreaker and, well, basically anywhere else that social media is seen and not heard. Okay, maybe it's heard too. You can go to theroodogshow.com, check out every past episode of the show. I have two very special guests. One brand new, the other very familiar to the show. Welcome, Rob Kosick. Baseball analyst and former slugger Corey Aldridge. Gentlemen, welcome to the show. Appreciate you taking your time out. Yeah, good to be here. Always nice to be here. Oh, I know, Corey. You like to be in it, and that's why one of these teams are going to win it. Rob, for you, the game last night and getting to the World Series is a is a very constant. Every single year, we have the game. It's no big deal at least not in spring training. But it seems to be very consistent as the year goes on. And those teams, and me and Corey spoken about this on the show before, how certain teams learn to find separation in their respective divisions, be it L, the AL or the NL. But one thing consistent are the bats. You've seen it throughout different people like Altuve, who's been an absolute beast all season long in the AL. Dodgers have been shutting people out left and right prior to the skid heading in the postseason. One of the best, Clayton Kershaw. But there were a lot of things I didn't see last night. Kershaw started game one. It was fluid. It was one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine. That's it. You're done. Kershaw commanded the mound. He did what he had to do. But something flipped. Now, I know Rich Hill's not the... He's not the Clayton Kershaw. He's not an elite... Pitcher. I mean, he does have good numbers. He does have a good ERA. But something that you were waiting for the Astros to really get into in Game 2, you didn't see in Game 1, was getting those bats hot early and often. Now, you can probably attest to this that prior to this year, three years previous, had one of the worst hitting percentages in all of baseball. Altuve was a non-factor so far. I see that changing. We'll talk about that later on in the show. What did you see from this Astros lineup that made you believe that they did have a chance early on against Rich Hill to take game two? I mean, one thing I saw is they were taking better at bats. Like, they were, um, you're like, I'm sorry, I'm hearing the, uh, my uh, voice in the back. I saw me about uh, what do you call it? A guy like George Springer, especially. He's, uh, his first at bat, you can tell you're seeing the ball a little bit better. Like he, was, he didn't bring it that curveball in the dirt. He wasn't chasing anything. And uh, that really set the tone, I feel like, for the game. Because uh, then he, uh, he just looked like he was seeing the ball a lot better and obviously in that whole run made the game. Uh, I think that's big. That's especially big for the Astros. A guy like him, you can get him going. Uh, it's going to be trouble for the Dodgers. What I like from Jose Altuve and Corey, this this is a part on this is right up your alley. Corey Aldridge, former players, played for the Angels and the Braves, and the list goes on and on. Corey, I look at Jose Altuve, and from a guy that looks so good in the ALCS, especially against the Yankees, not so much in game one and game two so far. What is he not doing? That's not making him a threat up to this point. Uh, what I saw yesterday um, was a guy not picking the ball up. I, I kind of had this talk yesterday with the people. You can see it how people make first and that, that something, something not visual didn't get off too well, whether it's, whether it's the daytime or not being familiar with that field. He's always going to be a threat. Their whole mindset, obviously their producer, knowing the team pretty well, knowing the hitting coach is there. Their mindset is swinging what you can burn. But also that comes with time and being able to practice and stuff like that. And you can see the first two innings, the first two matches on two days, 
that he couldn't get the ball up to him. Um, the last person I worried about was up But at the same time, you know, in baseball, you're not, you're not going to get three of them. And if, if all the person, all you have to play for is on Tuesday, they didn't make an ass of that great. But if they're swinging the way they're swinging now, now you got to focus on one through time, not just on Tuesday. But you, you must admit that he's been one of the constants in that lineup, regardless of what part of the order he's in. Altuve has been hitting balls that most players only dream of being able to hit, whether it's high, whether it's low, whether it's on the inside corner, outside corner. What makes Altuve more dangerous in Game 3 at Minute Maid Park on Friday? Well, well yeah. <laughs> um, I think he'll be able to play a lot, having to Give himself as a solid player, makes him a more aggressive player. Um, guys that come from the last position, most of the time, that's all they really have to get off those islands to get over there and play baseball. So, for now, they out that he's been his life proving that he's not a small flat there, proving he's made his baseball ball. He tries to prove it every day. He stays aggressive. Whether it's a single, an over, a triple, to a base in defense, to be dangerous because he has power. I look at Altuve as being one of those guys where no moment is too big for him. No part of the lineup is not that important to him because he's a team player. That's his mentality. That's who he's shown all season long. Could be the AL player of the year, in my in my opinion, regardless of whether or not the Astros even were thought about going to the World Series or even were an ALCS for that matter because I like what Altuve brought. Who says that short things don't come in small packages? Well, it's called fun size. And Altuve's been nothing less <laughs> than, than fun <laughs> in every single game you can think of this season. And it, it, it would not be... It would not be far-fetched for me to say, and, and I know, Rob, you're, you're, you're in the East Coast area, something you've seen from the Yankees, Aaron Judge, gigantic year, not taking anything away from what Aaron Judge has done because he's been an absolute beast, he's been on the tear, something that, that he's been doing all season long. Of course, today, the violent Joe Girardi, ouch. Uh, look, it was his day off. Was it more about his decision to leave? The Yankees, after losing against the Astros, was it something that had been on his mind, had been on the team's mind, if for some reason he didn't get to the World Series? I'm sorry, I didn't catch the question. I'm sorry, I had trouble hearing. No, that's perfectly okay. Joe Girardi gone from the Yankees. Yeah. I know it's a shocker to some, obviously not to Steinbrenner. But what's even more interesting is that he led them to an ALCS. And he helped his players move along in the right direction where they needed to go. Was this more about him wanting to leave in advance, or did the Yankees already have the writing on the wall just in case he didn't make it to the World Series to be released? I mean, this is something that's been a thing for a long time now. I mean, I live in the New York market, and I hear it on the radio stations, I see some papers. People are frustrated. They've been frustrated with Joe Girardi for years. He's been bad at the Yankees in plenty of ways. And it was just something that was running on the wall. I feel like they were just looking for a reason to let him go. And he, you can't really blame him for the, for the uh, Yankees not making the World Series this year. But uh, And, you know, I, I don't think you can even point to him as the reason that they got to the ALCS season. They had, they had a good bullpen, they had a ridiculous year from Aaron Judge, they had, there was a, a, lot, of, a lot of good factors in terms of the team itself. That I don't think you can even point to Girardi was the reason that they were where they were. And I think it's time that they go in a different direction. I saw it from Joe all year that he, he almost looked drained the entire year. I don't know if you guys know this. He, he almost looked like he lost a lot of weight. It was like he aged a lot this year. A lot of stress. I think it's a good move for both sides to move on. Girardi will have a job within the next year or two. And the Yankees need to move on and find a manager that can help these young players develop. Maybe like a Raul Ibanez is, is the first name that comes to mind. I think he'd be a good clubhouse leader. 
when I look at the New York Yankees and I look at that lineup and you have a mix of old and young, probably one of the best farm systems in the major leagues, I guarantee they have somebody waiting in the wings to take over George Girardi's spot. Now, it would be a far fetch, maybe a far cry, maybe something he doesn't want, but Reggie Jackson, first base coach. I, and I know I know it's a reach, but he's been there, done that. He's done it for a couple teams, in fact. Corey, when you look at a guy from, from a player-to-player perspective, when you look at Reggie Jackson, does he fit the bill? And do you know that it's something he would even want to ascertain and become the manager of the Yankees? Uh, I, I don't see that. I, I don't think that's. Uh, I don't think he's a good fit. I, I don't know, like, just having a guy like a, a full-on guy like that putting in, putting him into the into the position of like Yankees manager. I think it would just be a, a media circus. I don't think it would be good for a team like this. Uh, I, the, the New York media is crazy. I don't think having putting a guy like that in the manager position uh, would be good for this young team going forward. I think you need somebody that. It's going to fly under the radar and not uh, be in all the headlines. I think that's the best way the Yankees can go. What do you think, Corey? What are your thoughts? I'm actually right there with them. Um, coming from a player point of view or a guy that's still kind of in the loop, team, you know, Reggie's old school, man. And not that it's a bad thing, I think that he's great for the players. But the way the game of baseball is going and the analytics and the and Social media and all these things, and there's nothing happens to be out there. I don't, I'm more out of that good for Reggie because he won't like it. And Reggie would want control. But the way the game goes now is the, the control is the top. Maybe you don't have the control of any time. Someone probably got this. You know, you, know, you have this old man and then everybody's telling us that everything comes from the top. The manager is kind of like, I hate to be political, but that's what I'm saying. He's a favorite organization. And as good as Reggie might be, uh, he'd have to put the young player number one, and he'd have to give a quick order to the top. have to jump. The reason why I ask is because you look at Matthew Johnson on the other side, who, former NBA player, now co owner of the Dodgers, who also, not only the face of the franchise, but part of the organizational aspects to pull the players in making that U Darvis trade possible, getting over some other players, getting in guys, keeping guys. Chase Headley is one guy they probably will not miss next year. He has the, the ability to get the ball in the outfield, but not certainly the bat that he once was. But the mix of young and old, and then you see parity like this in, in the Astros, you see parity in the Yankees, you see parity in the Dodgers, a lot of parity when it comes to mixing the old and the new. Now, I'm not going to suggest that Matthew Johnson would be a great coach because, honestly, he doesn't know the first thing about baseball. But what he does know is how to get the right pieces in the right order to win championships. He's now the GM for the Los Angeles Lakers. That says a lot about him as a person. Again, getting the personnel. Or this is an NBA, but from an organizational standpoint, he's been great for the Dodgers up to this point. Whether or not they can cash in on the methodology he's put in position is another story altogether. And you're right. I completely agree with you, Rob. When I look at a guy like Reggie Jackson, a, a, a staple guy, Hall of Famer in Major League Baseball, he fits the players because he understands them. From an organizational standpoint, maybe not his cup of tea. And on point, Corey, in relation to, he may not want it. He may not want to get into the thick of things to even be considered in that role, but in, in either case, I think it's a, a good argument because they don't really have anybody else, at least not that I'm aware of, and you would probably know more about this, Rob. You mentioned another gentleman who could be in the running as the next general manager for the Yankees, but of course they're probably going to wait on that decision. But the Yankees would probably know better than I not to wait too long. Otherwise, it can get out of control real quick. This is Rudy Reyes with Rob Koss and Corey Aldridge right here on the Brew Dog Show. Let's move forward here because we have, we were talking about Altuve and how he's been such a designated guy. I know they don't have the DH because they're playing against it on Dodgers rules, things of that nature. 
Corey, technical question for you. Does the DH now exist because they're in the World Series at Minute Maid Park, or is the DH banned altogether throughout the World Series? I don't think the DH, um, I don't think the Indians are healthy to be. Um, that's the Astros for the Asian Lobster. But I, I, I kind of believe in my word. Um, when I look at both lineups, it gives the Astros trouble that the Dodgers actually find out of that. Um, they actually get the one of the problems I saw with the Yankees and other teams, and it's kind of ironic because they're pretty much all the other teams they're relying on all runs. And when I look at the Dodgers lineup, I see one of the nine guys grinding out of that, making the pitchers work, you know, actually being hit. So the offensive matchup is pretty, pretty I just say pretty even. So for the for, for the go to, let's just say that you have Correa who's stepping up, Bregman stepped up big yesterday, and other than Altuve, these have been the guys at least in game two, not season long, but in game two. I understand the club is much more resilient with many more role players when you think of hitting, but look, I'll be honest, Altuve is you know top notch guy, top notch thing, and he's shown it, he's played it, he's done it, but does it? And this will close out the Altuve conversation. And I'm going to ask both of you gentlemen, Rob, does Altuve have a superior game three at home, or is it just more about getting on base at Minute Maid Park in Houston? Um, I mean, uh, hitting, hitting that big home run, uh, that's good. But I mean, I think for him it's going to be a good mindset thing. I, I don't know what kind of game he's going to have in game three. Uh, the way, I, the way I look at it, um, obviously he's a big key for them, but uh, uh, like, the way he, he's looked bad at times, he's looked good at times, but uh, I think like, uh, he, he seems like hitting a big home run like that is, like I said, the mindset. I, I can see him having a big game in game three, and obviously going home back in Houston where the crowd's been great, uh, he's, he's been thriving there. I can see him having a huge game three. and. Uh, really propelling the Astros into control of the series. They could very well. They play two in Houston, so we're going to have to see if Altuve can get back to dominance at home that he's shown all season long. Corey, does Altuve come back? I mean, does he really have like this monster three-run home run game, and or maybe does he just go through the cycle? I mean, what do you believe his bat's going to look like if he doesn't break it on the first pitch? Oh, <laughs> uh, no, I I did not see him hitting three more home runs. Now, not that it can't happen, but it, it, I just don't see it happen. But uh, for Al Tuve, he, he's only going to be as effective as the guy in front of him and behind him. Uh, to me. And just like both of us. But because you're, you're, he's on the radar all the time. He's obviously such a pitch to you. But if you don't have to pitch him, you want to pitch to him. But if the guys are playing with behind them, especially if the guys are behind them, now you have to pitch them. Now you got to be more careful. And that's when you make mistakes and how people get you. You're in a, you're in a smaller stadium, ball carries to every corner. And you look at Belgium like that. Everybody can get all the way in the game. Well, they travel like this. But in Houston, the ball travels to each corner. Very easily, and it's, and it's a short, it's a short field. So now you got you know all the way in the left field, right field, center field, field, whatever. The ball to anybody else. But you get the same opportunity to use it all. I mean, to uh, the Dodgers all. Well, that's true. A short field does a whole lot for you, Dodger Stadium, third oldest uh, in Major League Baseball since 1962, since the Dodgers started playing there, coming over from from Brooklyn. But I have to ask you, Corey, when you look at the Dodgers. And I found this, I'm not going to say really disturbing, but it just kind of, it, it really made me wonder. Rich Hill's on the mound. He, he was ferried relatively well. I liked his motion. I liked his release. He threw for four innings. He only gave up three hits, one run, but seven strikeouts to boot. But was pulled. And I know everybody wants to have this conversation. Well, there's some type of method to the madness. Well, obviously there needs to be. But some of this can look at the game and say, well, it was so sort of premature to pull him. 
Um, of course, I'm in Los Angeles, and I'm not too far away from Dodger Stadium. Let's say the ravine is maybe an hour and a half away from me. Of course, traffic makes it three hours. You know how that goes. Was it premature, Corey, to pull Rich Hill, who is looking to do something more to stay consistent in additional innings? Uh, I don't think so. The simple fact that Rich Hill is like a power pitcher. So, I like I said, a lot, a lot of guys work against the ball well the first couple of innings. But you don't, you don't want to go through that lineup again for uh, the first time for the guy sitting at 88, 89, 90. Um, the biggest thing about the lineup that some fans don't get is that these daughters are winning the lineup to go for before they hit 85. But let's match up. The rich hitters, they can match up with the field 90 miles an hour. You know, so him going through that lineup three times, that's a dangerous lineup. I don't think that, I think that was a good call. I think where the mistake was made was maybe putting uh, Jansen in too early. Well, whoever the pitcher that pitched before Jansen, give him a chance to be out of that, be out of that area. If you're putting out the role that really aren't their role. Well, you look at Maeda. And what he did yesterday, I, I thought he looked good. I honestly, you, yeah, you you keep the guy in. Rob, what was your take on that? Did did did, did Roberts pull the plug unnecessarily on on Rich Hill? Yeah, I don't think so. I, I don't think he did. I think it was a, it was the right time. Dodgers is a team that has been built around that bullpen all year. They have they have the tools to be a great time. The guy Kenta Maeda is a great all postseason. I think uh, I think it was the right time. Uh, other things didn't work out. And Rich Hill is not Clayton Kershaw. Rich Hill is not a guy that you're going to send out there and know he's going to come back to the dugout on the skate. When you have the bullpen like that, you go to it when you can, when you think this is the time where you can shut them down and keep the keep the game in our favor. And now it didn't work out last night. I mean, uh, it, it's the way the Dodgers have been all year. Like. They, uh, I wouldn't expect a Dave Roberts to change his game plan now. And the move going to Jansen in the eighth, I, I love that. I love going to Jansen there with Altuve and Correa coming up. Get those guys then. The thing I didn't like was him keeping Jansen out there in the ninth. I thought he could have went to somebody else. I don't think you want to use up Jansen that much in game two of the World Series when you're up one nothing already. I thought they could have went to see Ronnie there with uh, with uh, Marlon Gonzalez coming up, who's another left handed hitter. Um, I think Josh, I don't remember where, who else was up, but it was a couple lefties, and then you had Beltran, the only one on the bench, who was also a better lefty hitter. I think I, I like the way Dave Roberts used his bullpen up until let Kenley Jansen go an extra inning. So I, I think he did everything. He pulled all the right strings last night, it, it didn't work out. When, when I seen Rich Hill, <laughs> in the dugout, he, uh, he he didn't think too kindly of being pulled out. Now look, have that have of all those counts been superiorly bad? Say say he goes three two, three two three two three two, and being Dave Roberts, I'm not a coach in Major League Baseball, but if I was Dave Roberts, I'd say, well, the guy is struggling. He's he's failing to get out the weakest part of the Astros lineup. At that point, you need to pull the plug and call it a day. But Rich Hill's body language was as if, and, and the numbers support that. I understand that Dave Roberts wants to cycle through pitchers. I understand that's what they've been doing all season long. It's been working for them. Whether or not somebody has a, a, a moment where they're not feeling all that well and needs to take some, uh, some medication to chill out or whatever because they don't agree with the call. I don't know that I necessarily agree with the call either because of his strength. I'm not saying that Rich Hill is the answer. No, he's not a power guy. He's a finesse guy. He's a finesse guy. He had seven strikeouts prior to being pulled. It's not as if he he gave up you know four hits and five runs and his ERA took a tank. I mean, he was there. He was effective. I would have thought at least keep him in one more inning, at least based on his production, to determine whether or not you need to go to the next guy. Whether it be Maeda, uh, uh, which I, I felt pitched a very, you know, again, leaving Maeda in longer would have, again, extended it probably not as much 
of an uphill climb that Jansen had to go through when he was up, but he gave up a home run. Maeda didn't do that. Hill didn't do that. So is, it, is this more about Jansen who blew the close? I mean, can we honestly say that he blew the close? He did. Like, he, yeah. he, he did. Okay. I had two people yelling at me. Yes, he did. Okay. No. <laughs> no, that's all right. No, that's no, no worry. But I agree with you. Jansen blew the call. But one thing about Jansen, this kind of moves on to my next topic, and then we're going to move on to Mordecai Brown and the 1906 Chicago Cubs starting A's. We'll talk about that as well. Jansen found his way to pick out of that. In other words, he picked his poison, he picked his pitches, ultimately pitched himself out of it. Damage was done. But it was up to the other guys, the hitters for the Dodgers, trying to extend this every single time they were at bat. Home run after home run, 7-6. That's how it ended. When you look at Hill's performance, Corey, overall, is there any way, anything he could have done better that would have suggested to Dave Roberts to leave me in at least another any longer, or was he done? I don't think so. I think, I think that they had a game plan going in. I, I think the only thing that Matt Hart was, um, who missed the touchdown? Follow somebody? Yeah, that was like the only thing I knew at that time. Uh, I do think that Maida can win one more inning. They can't make my construction out longer. But I, I hate to take it against Lucy. I, I, I don't, I don't want to be a cow. I want to be a cow coach. Because they, obviously what they've been doing is hoping to the point. Now it's up to play next. I mean, you don't go in the game thinking, oh, what a chance to play this. If you have to vote. But it happened. I mean, you didn't. Put a, put a simple fact in front of him, he didn't expect that man to get, get, get beat around a little bit. But he did. And, you know, so you can't, you don't want to count that you come second guess something after it happened. But it could be easy to point out exactly what he wanted it and he was going to do it. So it's just, I think he did the right thing as far as Rich. Um, he did a job. Rob, we were, I had touched on Mordecai Brown, and I think you're right, Corey. They could have kept Maeda in at least another half of any half any longer, maybe even another full inning. But he was giving up nothing. He was giving up absolutely nothing. And you stick in Moro, really Moro? Okay, fine. I give him his props. He's there. He's playing on a team that's in the World Series. So be it. That's what Robert's decision was, and we all obviously all have to live with that decision more so then than anybody else. But Rob, we talked about Mordecai Brown. I want to touch on this for half a minute. Started 1906, Game Six of the World Series. Of course, we're not talking Game Six here, but Game Six, we're talking about clutch situations. He was a lights out pitcher up until that point. He only pitched two innings, but given him eight hits, seven runs for a whopping seven errors, which ultimately led to that loss. So when I asked you about Jansen, of course, you, when you look at Stripling, why he even entered the game is beyond my mind. It blows my mind. He pitched just one hitter. Jansen had the ability to close this thing out. He gave up. Mordecai Brown gave up four hits, a pair of doubles, three runs in the first inning. But what got things rolling for him that were in a negative and not in his favor was that in the second inning he got two outs but went on to allow four more innings before the team had to go to the bullpen. Not a situation that Jansen certainly wanted to be in. But again, this is not game six. Let me just make sure I set that tone there. Hill didn't dig them a hole. And moving on to game three, you Darvish will get the start for the Dodgers, and the Astros will start McCullough's Jr. 
when you think of a good matchup, is this probably one of the better matchups in World Series that you can remember? Are you there, Rob? Oh, oh, no, you were asking the movie? I'm sure you were asking my answer. Well, I was sure to start with that. Uh, I call it, these are two guys that come in, like, they're, they've been on fire all for the season. Um, I, I expect this game to go pretty quickly, too. Um, McCullough has been nasty. Darvish is the type of pitcher that gives me answer of fits. Like, just like Rich Hill, he's going to finesse on the deck. And, uh, yeah, like the Astros are a great fastball hitting team, and they're just not going to see that out of Darvish very much. Darvish is going to throw him a lot of junk. Um, I expect this game to be about a two, kind of like game one, where it was just like a quick game where he took a, took a 10 minute nap and missed the first five innings of the game. Uh, I, expect this, I expect this game to go real quick. Um, two starting pitchers that have been hot, obviously. Uh, and um, yeah, it's definitely one of the better matchups. Uh, uh, obviously, after Kershaw and uh, Michael, I think this is a matchup that people that have been paying attention to the postseason have been looking forward to. And uh, I'm excited because I, I, I grew up a pitcher. I'm a big fan of these pitching duels, and I'm, I'm expecting another one to, uh, tomorrow night. Yeah, because Game 3 is now in Houston. It's a Minute Maid Park. For those that don't know, we're live. I'm live on Facebook, live on Spreaker. This is Rudy Rance of the Rude Dog Show. Uh, joined by Rob Kosick, Corey Aldridge, talking game two and a little bit more so about game three. Why? Because it's on the horizon. It's something that everybody needs to be aware of. Lance McCullers Jr. will start, and then Charlie Morton takes the bump on Saturday. McCullers had went 7-4, 4.25 ERA. McCullers in the playoff had a 2.08 ERA. These are the tale of two McCullers, right? Because your ERA jumps... Because of the types of throws that you're able to make successfully during postseason, then the regular season. McCullers that climbed through the career highs for starts, 22 wins and seven wins this season, and was ex ex exceptionally good at home, going unbeaten in nine starts and posting a 3.4, a 04 ERA, and he's carried it into the playoffs so far, giving up only three runs and one start and two relief appearances. He came out of the AL against the Yankees, just one hit and four scoreless innings earning that same. Do you see a lot of that? Do you see a reflection, Corey, from what we witnessed against the Yankees and maybe applying it here to the World Series from Lance McCullers Jr.? Uh, I I'm kind of like Rob, kind of match I'm looking at a picture of I think um, I think the Dodgers though can give them a little trouble. But here for a simple fact that they wind out of that. They're not everybody's not there looking for the homer. They can hit it. Now you got the Bellinger, the John Peterson. Um, they're going for home. They're really going for home. But Bellinger would come down, I'll give a two strikes and take the double and take it with the gap. Um, I think the Astros they can look they just win. They're reckless of them, but they don't fit. So, so going against a guy like McCullough, I think I think the I think the, I think the Dodgers come in be an offensive defense. For a guy like the uh, uh, Dodgers guy, Dodgers, he's coming in probably thinking we go for a five game. He's going to be up to hundred dollars an hour. Not not including his slider, his six fingers. Change up to whatever we have. This game's the best that Dodgers have for four to five straight. Because he's not going to What's so, I think he's better than McCullough for that five minutes. I could agree with that. And, and, and here's why the type of weaponry that McCullough has. And what he typically throws is that 12-6 curveball. He's got a very hard sinker. I've seen him drop that thing like a weight in the ocean. His changeup can be nasty, too. Sneaking in the inside corner 
get guys swinging and think it's coming on the out, but it's going to the end. And his 94 seam fastball is probably his weapon of choice. I think that's going to give some guys some, some trouble as well. And, and not necessarily the youths of the Dodgers, but maybe even some of the veterans. Certainly that's going to be game, game three, and we'll let that make the determination. But when you look at game three, Darvish gets a start. Here's the tail of the tape here. Rob, I'm going to break it down. You probably know this better than I. Darvish's ERA is 3.86. And a very looking, differently looking Darvish, historically in the playoffs, are 2-0 with a 1.59 ERA. Darvish is a chopping block kind of guy at the Texas Rangers trade in July. Two key pitches. I expect to see a lot more of that slick, off-cuff, off two-finger slider. And his type of cutter to really be the daggers throwing not literally, but in, in a baseball sense, that's really what they are. Do you look for those two to be a mix and match as he puts a, a resume together to possibly do good through five or six innings? I'm sorry, what was, I, I kind of lost a little bit of that in the middle. Like, no, that's the right. It, it, the, Darvish has a nasty slider. He's got a good fashion cutter. It's, it's slick. He can sneak it on the inside of you. Do you see a lot of you, Darvish, going with those two weapons of choice to continually keep his ERA low and being more effective on the mound on Friday? I mean, yeah, those are the pitches that have been working for him all year. I expect him to, uh, I, you know, I expect him to use his whole arsenal. Of, uh, Darvish is a guy that throws, like, the, the, it's always been said that he can throw, like, seven different pitches. And uh, you got a, you got a team like the Astros that just cross fastballs. They have all year uh, two made the fastball hitter, Correa, all these guys in that lineup. I expect uh, Carlos to use more of the golf speed stuff against them, keep them off balance, like, and use his uh, use his fastball as more of a put away pitch, kind of get these hitters off balance, like get them picking to these breaking balls and using that fastball to, as a uh, like I said as a finishing pitch more than more than anything, more to keep them honest. Like, so I think like Darvish is a guy that can very easily give his best to the lineup fits with the uh, with the arsenal of pitches he has. And the reason why I'm asking is because the Astros aren't extremely familiar with you, Darvish. I mean, they, they, they faced him 14 times in his entire career. That doesn't build a lot of familiarity. It doesn't build a real game plan. I mean, you, you clearly know some of his more accurate, you know, pitches to make him more dynamic, to make him stand out to you, because perhaps he struck you out. So at that point, you know. <laughs> it's already set the tone. Winning five of those games, five out of 14, which is not very good if you think about the numbers, but Astros manager stated they had history with him, they were aware of him, but of course history doesn't mean anything about the future. Rob, when you look at the future of, of, of Darvish, of course we can look in the crystal ball games Friday and we can make all the uh, type of provocations we want and prognostications and so on and so forth, but when you look at this game, is it more about the Dodgers' advantage despite the Astros being at home and playing relatively well there? They have to have the dance going on because we got a, a, a city that hasn't been in the World Series. I don't know if it was a few years ago, but you're going to be winning. You're, you're, you're coming from the hurricane issue. Uh, you know, a lot of things have gone on down here negatively. And the city's rallying together. They're going to be loud. Uh, the players are ready to go. And they're they're riding the momentum from yesterday's game. So I think they're definitely, you know, coming out swinging. They're, def they're definitely not, their tail's definitely not going to be touching. I think they're going to be really toughened up there in Houston. Why? Because of all the aforementioned natural disasters that doesn't typically hit a city like, like Houston. I remember watching the opening day against uh, the, the Houston Texans and how much hype there was at their stadium, at Reliant, 
trying to get people to really rally behind them, and they had this Houston Straw movement. It's still there. It's still, it's still existed, but it's kind of translated, and, and, and it's moving forward to where now not only did J.J. Watt start something that's more fluent, but now you have the Astros in the World Series for the first time. They've only missed this is their second appearance. Is there something about the crowd that will get the Astros up early, often, and really feeling it to basically put this game away early for the Astros against the Dodgers on Friday? I mean, I think obviously this is a city that, that uh, needed something to rally around after all these uh, disasters, like all that big disaster they had. Uh, and the Astros have given it to them. They've really given this city something to stand behind, to feel proud about. Like, it's, it's, it's a way to escape for, for a lot of these people. And obviously, going like this ballpark, this ballpark's been loud. Like, you have that, I, I've watched these games on TV, you hear that train in left field that. When it goes off, it like it hurts my ears sitting on the couch. Like it's uh, the the ballpark's gonna be loud. The people are gonna definitely be crazy. Um, and yeah, absolutely, this could be something that if they get off to a hot start, put the Dodgers away early. Like the crowd's a big factor. And uh, another another big factor to go obviously going to the AL Park is they can stick a guy like Evan Gaddis in the lineup, a guy who's did all year, a guy who's been a factor in the postseason. And the Dodgers go to the AL, and now they have to put somebody who's been a relative bench player all year into the lineup. The, the Astros have plenty of advantages going home, and um, I think it, it could really turn the series around. I, personally, I didn't think they had a chance before uh, the series started, but winning Game Two, now you got you got the city believing. I, I think it's. Uh, I, I think the Astros are in good shape right now. I think this is exactly where they want to be. When you could travel on the road, I know it's the same in any organized sport where you have to travel from one city to the next city to the next state and so on and so forth. It is tough playing on the road. It just is. Going to somebody else's house, one of the, the biggest game of probably your lifetime, and you're very fortunate to even get back to that game ever again, and you could have the same conversation about those in the NFL, about not being able to get there worked your whole life, been on all these Pro Bowl teams and, and, and appeared in the Pro Bowl and you know you've won your a a AFC championship or you've won your AL and your NL. This game, the stage, the timing, and what's really interesting and what really took me back, we're talking about uh, cities who are struggling, LA uh, recently, not necessarily LA, but we're dealing with a lot of I mean, it's a, it was 104 yesterday, so we're dealing with some relatively high temperatures. And what that really means is that at the ravine at Dodger Stadium, it's been over 103, 104, 105 at pitch time here in Los Angeles. Could that have affected the game's outcome? Nah, maybe. But we've also been dealing with a lot of fires. Uh, brush tree fires, there's been fires that wiped out the entire uh, great area in Santa Rosa, just slightly up north from here, so also facing their own battles. But to have Houston travel so far, to tie this series up in somebody else's house, says a lot about their resilience. Look, regular season is not postseason. Corey, you know that better than anybody. Postseason, a whole nother animal. It's a whole nother playbook, a whole nother mindset. Can the Dodgers do the same thing and take the lead in Houston? Or is this more of a rally cry? Can the Houston Astros put it away like they have all regular season long? And of course, including some ALCS conversation, how they did it against the Yankees in Houston. Can the Astros put this away at home and advantage Houston as they travel back to Los Angeles? Uh, I think the Dodgers have a fair chance of, of making a great series of it. Um, again, like Rob said, coming to Houston, it's, it's, not, it's not an easy task. You don't have to worry about the weather, so that's, that's a plus. Uh, it's evenly, evenly matched part offensively in the small field. Um, I'll tell you what I said last time, we met Lisa Lee to say we are going to win. Who made the most mistakes last time? 
Look up. You know, you have a costly hit flash error with that leaf. You know, you have a lot of little media things that happen that the developers lost the game. It wasn't they should have lost the game if guys kind of do their job. And then after it got tied up, we had an after the point. But the Dodgers probably should have won it. Um, you know, so they're going to run into the park then. I'm going to put the Astros down here in Houston. Uh, I think they have a great chance of winning this World Series. I just think that, I think their lineup is a little more different. I think Houston has a really good chance. If, if they start building the emotion, if, if they start really putting themselves in front, getting getting the order, getting the batting order down, make sure everybody understands the rotation, getting into the swing of things. This is just a regular game for most people. I mean, you watch it from your couch, it's, well, it's just another baseball game. Well, it's not. This is the World Series. This is for all the models. I think we may have lost Rob. Rob, are you there? Yeah, yeah, I'm here. Okay. No problem. So, Rob, I'm going to ask you first, and we're going to probably move into the to, to the latter part of the show. 7-6 Astros yesterday. Is there a repeat performance? Are they going to be a 1-Z, 2-Z differential between the NL winning Los Angeles Dodgers and the AL winning Houston Astros in this World Series there, one Z, two Z effect you're going to see throughout the series, that'll be a constant. Uh, I mean, this is like you're talking about like I'm sorry, what keep repeating question on that kind of thing. Well, I mean you're you're gonna have a one Z two Z lead. You know, one's gonna have one, one's gonna have two run lead and and, and, and so between the Dodgers and the Houston Astros, you're going to see a one, two, where one's leading higher than the other throughout the series. Is this going to be a constant? Um, yeah, I think most of these games are going to be close. I think uh, the the Dodgers offense has really showed that they're uh, that they're all there right now, and uh, and it, 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 like it, it's been obviously last night they they hit a bunch of home runs, but like. Uh, it's been it's been a weird couple games. Like the, the uh, Dodgers game one had two hits, two home runs, or is that uh, that might be game two? I don't know. I, I'm trying to remember, but uh, I don't. I think this, these are two teams that are pretty well evenly matched in terms of offenses and strong pitching. Um, and once you get to the bullpen, that's where the difference obviously is. Uh, the Dodgers have a bullpen that could just shut you right down, and that's that, that's really the thing that, that I look at as the big difference here is uh, like these games. Like I think these games are going to stay close, but with a, with a bullpen like the Dodgers have, that the bullpen that the Astros have that has struggled. You got Ken Giles who, who all year, and, and Davinsky who both struggled. was to go lopsided, I think it's more likely in the Dodgers' favor. Because uh, the bullpen just really hasn't shown much. I, I think the Dodgers have really put themselves in a situation. I mean, they, they, they didn't do themselves any favors yesterday. I mean, they had nobody else to go to. They had McCarthy. McCarthy? Really? McCarthy? He allowed two hits, two runs, and committed two errors. I don't find his presence on the mound, if I was a Dodger fan, which I'm not, but if I was, I'm not comfortable with him on the mound. Corey, did he look any even remotely comfortable to you on the mound? Because he looked like, like a scared rabbit. His first two pitches were hit in the whole game. Um, he went in there and tried to paint the outside corner, didn't get the call. He was done. He was done. And then I know the umpires have been a topic of conversation. Uh, which I do agree, as far as the strike down goes. But once you do the first few pitches, it seems like he's going to have to hit her. He was kind of done because he didn't get the call he wanted. I mean, they gave him a home or a number or something. Uh, but obviously, that's all they had to do, really. As a manager, 
for any potential team, the, the best thing you can do for your players is put trust in your players. Like, they have to know that you're behind them on everything. And, and uh, we talked about it before, and that's what makes a good manager. That's, that's what you have with Dusty Baker and Jerry Frank on and Bill Madden and even guys like Bobby Thompson. Every player knows that no manager has to have You just have to go make it. I think, I just don't think Billy Adler, he wasn't even on the roster until yesterday. So he's probably flat. You know, he probably doesn't think he's going to pitch. Once I tell you, once you put the closer in and a guy like Jansen, usually your bullpen starts to shut down. So I guarantee you, this will probably shut down and have you shut back in. It's just an uncommon situation to put that's just how sports work. Everybody has their role. And once that role changes or once that sequence changes, you can kind of look for the master to get. It can go either way, but you'd be happy to take it. Well, it did. It did. Matter of fact, it did for the Astros as well when we put in Davinsky, who, who, who gave up a run, a hit, committed an error, a strikeout, and allowed a home run. That's why this game was so close. The differences between Fields, Singrani, and McCarthy were the differences between Verlander and Davinsky. Just based on numbers alone. Verlander, to talk about him for just a moment, Verlander was absolutely in control for the first half until the sixth inning, and that was it. I don't think he was kept in too long. I mean, he pitched six innings. He had two hits, three runs, three errors, five strikeouts, but allowed two home runs. Those were critical. Do you see Verlander facing off against Kershaw in game five, Rob? I think it really depends how these next couple games go. I think if, uh, if it's a do or die game five where they lose their out, then absolutely, I think Justin Merlin is pitching game five, but if it's a 2-2 two -two series, uh, you know, I, honestly, either way, I can see he could probably go out there, I'm sure he's going to want the ball again, and I'm sure for A.J. Hitch putting him out there at game five and then potentially having him available for game seven and out of the bullpen would be, uh, would be ideal, so I think, I think if you have a 3-1 series in Dodgers' favor, but, I mean, I, you know what, like, the more I'm thinking about it, I think either way, Justin Verlander is going to be going game five for the Astros. Now, for AJ Hitch, like, you look at that bullpen, it's, who, who can he trust right now? Who, who, do you, who do you pick up the phone and say, like, I, I want this guy coming in? There's really nobody in that bullpen that, if I was AJ Hitch, that I could fully trust right now. Uh, I think for Justin Verlander, he definitely wasn't left in too long in game six, because... AJ Hinch doesn't have anybody in that pen he can trust. He really has maybe three four pitchers he can trust and they're all in his they're all in his rotation right now. For the Dodgers, Corey, is this game five going to be another revisit with Clay Kershaw starting for them? I mean the guy puts every ounce of effort. Every ounce of who he is goes into every pitch that he makes. That's why he's a two-time Cy Young Award winner. Does he do it again? And if so, does he face off in Game 5 against Verlander, if in fact that does occur? I'll do a lot of things on the pitch. I mean, it's no reason to burn him. You'll have to burn him. He's getting that whatever he needs. If you got, like you said, the only thing you can press right now is the start. So if he's over a good at your two, uh, I probably wouldn't burn. Uh, that's just me. I'm not a manager. I hate managing any. But you always just take the good. Um, but, uh, the one thing we haven't really talked about is just burn it. I think. Well, again, I just I think right now with the Astros not having a bullpen. Let's talk about Justin Turner then. 
Justin Turner, the unsung hero, all season long for the Dodgers. He's one of those hidden gem guys. Of course, when I look at him, I want to think, where are your lucky charms? But the only lucky charm that he needs to worry about is that bat. That bat has been absolutely dangerous. Sure, he was a New York Mets cast off in 2016, and the other component, Chris Taylor, as soft-spoken as he is, another cast off by the Seattle, uh, Seattle Mariners. These guys have both contributed a lot to this team all season long and have shown it now in the World Series. Do they continue even, oh, they only share, I don't know, maybe a half an ounce differential between them when they slug? Do these guys become the key cocks down the trench for the Dodgers, Rob? Um, I mean, yeah, Justin Turner's been the key guy for them all year. He's been their MVP. He's the guy who stepped up in all the great situations. The key for the Astros is definitely shutting him down. And the way Chris Taylor's been hit, he's uh, at the top of that order. He's, he's been deadly. And uh, it's just two guys right now that if you're looking at it from the Astros' perspective, like, those are the guys you got to worry about. Because they've been seeing, they've both been seeing the ball well. Obviously, I'm, I'm a guy, I'm, I'm a diehard Mets fan. They're talking about Justin Turner in the World Series. It's very painful for me. Um, but uh, he's a guy that, like, he doesn't have any weaknesses, and there's really this, you can go in there with a game plan against him, but is, he's a guy who's very good at in-game adjustments. Uh, he, you saw it in uh, game one, he, he got jammed a couple times, or then he, uh, he switched his he switched bat, switched his approach. I mean, he, he's as good of a hitter as we have in the game today, and it, he's a key to shut down for the Astros, but... Absolutely, it's, it's uh, he's their number one priority right now. If, if I'm uh, in that call now, you got to shut down Justin Turner to shut down the Dodgers. Corey, I, I look at you talking about how painful it was for to see Justin Turner in the World Series. Of course, it's always painful. I mean, uh, there's a couple of pirates and uh, got traded. To the Dodgers as well for later considerations and cash and so on. From the Pirates to the Dodgers, of course, it always pains me to see other players now peaking, or sort of, I guess for lack of a better term, peaking on another team. Do you think Justin Turner is, or could be rather, this World Series MVP if the Dodgers go on to win this? Uh, I've definitely think that's a possibility. Um, Andrew Henderson played a big game. You see that you see that few games to worry about that. Um, the biggest thing with him and, and both of them, just saying is that you know they went through a period of swing chase. Um, a lot of guys are doing. One thing I find always funny is that all these guys that are coming back after 20 years, they never really use the Organizational hitting coach in offseason. Justin Turner worked with one of my guys, um, a good friend of mine, the Paul of Bird, the Kenny Dock. I, I watched it firsthand of his swing change and watching what he's doing now, taking to the game. But at the same time, I was talking about veterans. He could get that half a team because he makes other guys be on his You know, whether it's talking about Approach what he's seen, swing pass or whatnot. That's the part of baseball that most people don't see. And that's another thing that makes Justin Turner good. Because he's still in the ear of the Johnson Peterson, Jefferson, whatever else he wants. He's preparing these guys for the back. The same thing that Alonzo Powell for the Astros is doing for the Astros. Like, you don't see him going down the tunnel for Kennedy to hit. Talk to him about a person. The rats are different than that, so is this your offense? Gentlemen, my time is up, but thank you so much, both of you guys, for coming on to the Rude Dog Show. This is Rudy Reyes.
on the July to do this radio network. Rob, where can people interact with you and gain your wonderful uh, baseball knowledge? Well, I'm sorry, I, I get that. Where can people find you at, Rob? Where do people work? I'm where, gonna, uh, where can people find you? If they wanted to read your blogs or, or read more about you or listen to podcasts that you're on, where can they find you? With the, um, I, 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 I'm not hearing anything right now, I'm sorry. I'm missing like half the stuff you're saying. We have a Twitter, it's called Rob. R-O-B-K-O-S-T-O-B-K-O-S-T-O-B-K-O-S-T-O-B-K-O-S-T-O-B-K-O-S-T-O-B-K-O-S-T-O-B-K-O-S-T-O-B-K-O-S-T-O-